Thank you, Helen. Thanks so much. It's nice to hear that every now and again and be reminded. Um, this is quite the, quite the set of verses, isn't it? I mean, there's a lot in that little bitty portion that Kaylee read. Well, did Kaylee? Kaylee, you read it. Yes. That, that we had read to us. We, it, there's just so much there. And usually what we hear is the story about Thomas. Because we can all identify with Thomas and doubt. And, and, and that's kind of who we are, isn't it? But because we so often hear about doubt, we tend to miss those first few verses. Thomas is a pretty big gun, you know? He's yeah, one of those disciples that everybody says, yeah, Thomas is my saint. But we miss those first few verses. And so I wanted to look at the first few verses where Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, gives the disciples the Holy Spirit, and therefore gives us the Holy Spirit, and talks about forgiveness. As Kaylee said, Jesus still had things to teach even after the resurrection. I, I want to, to do some defining here. We, we throw words around in church all the time. Well, everywhere we throw words around and we rarely know what they mean. So, so um, I, I couldn't find an actual dictionary. Can you believe that? I looked everywhere and I could not find an actual dictionary. So this is everybody's dictionary. So I will give you the dictionary, the, the definition of a word that everybody knows. I mean, it's a really easy word. The word is from. You all know how to define from, right? It's a starting point in measuring or reckoning or in a statement of, of limits. Like he came here from the city. It's used as a function word to indicate the starting or focal point of an activity. Called me from a payphone or from a cell phone. Used as a function word to indicate physical separation or an act or condition of removal, abstention, exclusion, release, subtraction, or differentiation. Don't forget the differentiation. Protection from the sun. Relief from anxiety. Or the third definition here, used as a function word to indicate the source, cause, agent, or basis. We conclude from this or a call from my lawyer. So, from, little four-letter word with at least three definitions, and we probably could come up from, with more. And I'm still not certain what it said, but I know what from means. Y'all know what from means. You use it, I bet, all the time. So, all these words that we use and we rarely define, and if somebody who is a non-English speaker says, well, what does from mean? we probably don't go into this. We, we give them a picture of what it means. But the same thing is true in church. Do we define, can we even define the words we use? Now, I'm not talking about the biggies, the, 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 the $10 words like Christology and eschatology and Trinitarian. Those are very churchy words. And we expect to wrestle with those words. And we really don't expect to use words like eschatology much beyond the church, if in the church, except for your pastors, maybe. But I'm thinking more of the little words we, we throw around in church all the time, words we all think we know, words that everybody uses and few of us ever grasp or really employ. Words like forgiven. Now, I know you're going to say, I know what forgiveness means. I know what forgiven is. That's an easy one. It means, well, 
It means we're forgiven. God forgives our sins. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Whoopee, we can use it in a sentence. But what does it mean to give, truly, deeply give or receive forgiveness? To understand forgiveness, we sort of kind of have to look at sin first. How can we be forgiven if we don't know that from which we are forgiven? Hamartia, that's the English transliteration of the Greek. Hamartia, and that's the, the Greek word that's translated sin. And it's an archery term. And it just means you miss the mark. I don't know about you, but that's what I do all the time in archery, um, is miss the mark. But that's a lot of what I do in life, too. Fall short of the target. That's what hamartia means. That's what sin is. We fall short of a target. As in, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Ah, wait a minute, you say nobody's perfect. And that's true. But sin is not about perfection. Sin is about internal and external targets, about goals and expectations that when they are not reached, separate us from God. Uh, that's not what I think of when I think of sin. But, but think about it this way. Honesty is a goal, right? I mean, in my life, in your life, every day, honesty is a goal. I, want, I, I aim to be honest in every encounter. But if I lie, or don't tell the whole truth when someone needs it, or if I spread rumors, or if I cheat on something, then I have fallen short of that target. And that separates me from whomever I've mistreated, whoever I've lied to, whoever I've not told the full truth to, whoever I've gossiped about. It separates me from them. And therefore, it separates me from God because God desires us to love, to be in fellowship with one another. So that's what sin is. Very simple. It's not this great big huge word. It's an everyday kind of all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We just don't get there all the time, even though we mean to get there all the time. Now, sin really is a whole separate sermon. So the focus today is just to name what sin is and how is it that I resolve? Let's look at the resolution of that separation, that, that falling short, that missing the mark. Scripturally, the way is forgiveness. I confess to the person I've wronged and to God. I ask for, and I hope, receive forgiveness. Because without it, there's a barrier between me and God. And I make restitution if needed and if possible. So, so what is forgiveness that it's so powerful to heal this shortfall? Again, that a definition from the, the dictionary on just a moment here. There we go. This is the Cambridge Dictionary. Forgiveness is to stop blaming or being angry with someone for something that person has done or to not punish them for something. So the example they give is forgiving someone for, for something or for doing something. I don't think she's ever quit, quite forgiven me for getting her name wrong that time. Uh, or I'd never forgive myself if anything happened to the kids. Please, please forgive me. Just short. Just, that's, that's all the definition they give. Used before you ask or say something that might seem rude to stop blaming, 
Stop blaming or being angry. Those are big ones, aren't they? To pardon or excuse. They're simple. They're straight. It's a straightforward thing, isn't it? I say I'm sorry. You say it's okay. I forgive you. And life goes on. Right? Happens all the time. So why is it that the British and the Irish are still fighting about Northern Ireland after 300 plus years? Why are blacks and whites in the U.S. still struggling when slavery was abolished 160, 70 years ago? Why is it that the Arabs and Israelis have been fighting biblically since Abraham, or at least since the, the 1949 war? And, and why did my grandfather die without speaking to his brother for 40 years? Because they fought over their parents' very, very, very small estate. That estate cost them a relationship. I'm betting you can all add your own example here. You know someone, somewhere, or you can think nationally, internationally, of an incident where because uh, something happened, Greg and I have been watching World War I shows, because Archduke Ferdinand was shot, there was a four-year war that killed half the men in Europe. That's the kind of thing forgiveness is about. Why does any of this matter? Well, did you hear verse 23 of today's gospel reading? If you retain, re receive the Holy Spirit, if you forgive the sins of any. This is what he tells, to the, tells the disciples as they go out. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. There's a better translation of that in Eugene Peterson's The Message. If you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive the sins, what are you going to do with them? Just think about it. What are you going to do with them? It's kind of like defining from. I can't give you a, a, a really tight definition of forgiveness that you can that you can see every time, but I can use it in a sentence. I can use it in lots of sentences. I, I read a story, oh gosh, this is ages ago. I read a story in the paper about a woman, her dog, and the paper boy. The boy kicked the dog because the dog bit him. The woman loved the dog and hated the boy for his acts, but she didn't make any attempt to control the dog. And finally, the, dog, the boy had to call the animal control people and they put the dog to sleep because he was still biting. The woman decided she would hound the boy for what he had done to her beloved dog. She called him every half hour, every day, for a week, and then for a year. When she was finally in a nursing home in her 80s, they would help her to the phone in her wheelchair. The phone calls only stopped when the woman died. There's an old saying that, that forgiveness, holding a grudge, is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. This woman poisoned herself until her death because of that paper boy's one act. A little severe? Most people aren't like that. But what about a couple in the middle of a divorce who use custody issues to hurt the other spouse, regardless of the impact on the children? Or what about the neighbors who haven't spoken in years because of arguments over someone's tree who fell on, some, on somebody else's roof, and we're not really sure what started all that, but we think that's what it was? Or, or whose children picked someone else's vegetables in their garden? And don't kid yourself, it happens in the church, too. There are church members who do not speak to other members because of words 
said in haste, or changes made, even though my grandmother donated that particular whatever it was. Members who stop attending the church they were raised in over anger or, or some perceived slight that the other person didn't even realize was a slight. If you don't choose to forgive the sin, what are you going to do with it? So there's Jesus in the upper room where the disciples are hiding. They're not just having dinner. No, no, no. They are locked away, it says, in the upper room for fear of being known that they had been with Jesus. For fear they were locked away. Certainly Jesus had a reason to show himself to somebody other than the disciples who couldn't even admit they knew Jesus. But there he was asking the impossible of people who had already failed him. He tells them to be at peace. And we saw the disciples trembling and then realizing Jesus is calling them to be at peace and it's Jesus who's calling. And then after he's called them to be at peace, he sends them out. He sends us out. Not an easy assignment for them especially when he reminds them about forgiveness. He's telling them to forgive everything that's coming, their own trials and persecutions, their own doubters, the people who will leave them out of fear or out of doubt, their own deaths. And all of the, all of the disciples met martyrs' deaths. Whatever you forgive on earth, remains forgiven. Life isn't a bowl of cherries. We know that. And Jesus has learned that and let it go. Now, if you think about it, a 21st American Jesus probably would have said from the cross, you'll be hearing from my lawyers. Or don't go down without a fight. But the first century Jesus of Palestine said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What will you do? What will I do with the sin that surrounds me? How do I cope? How do you cope when you fall short of what's expected of you? Or of what you expect of yourself, or of those around you that let you down. What's the big deal, we think? We apologize, it's over, and then inside we go, yeah, but sometimes I wish. Or you probably, well, no, you, you can't possibly know the burden that I bear. I can never forgive what he did. I've heard that just in the last week. Or maybe I'll forgive, but not for a while. I'm not ready yet. She couldn't find it in herself to forgive me. God, where do we get off saying this? But we do. God couldn't possibly forgive a sin like that. That's where that binding and loosing language comes in. That's when we're called to put the pain in the past to discuss it, to face it, to deal with it, and to be done with it. Several years ago, I heard this wonderful statement that's kind of been a mantra for me. Forgiveness happens when we stop trying to rewrite the past. I tend to be an if-only person. I rehash things and rehash them ad nauseum in my mind. I could have, I should have, he didn't need to, he might have, if I hadn't, maybe I should. That's why the Roman Catholic Church has the sacrament of reconciliation, it used to be called confession. It's now called reconciliation. Tell someone what you did. Speak the truth. Keep it from the darkness. Don't hold it in your soul. Bring it out into the light. And then you have to deal with it. You have to take action. 
No more letting it fester and, and eat you alive. Apologize. Seek or give forgiveness, whichever it's yours to do. Be ready to be unforgiven. One of the definitions, one of the psychological definitions of forgiveness is it's about letting go of the anger and, and, and the, the resentment. But it doesn't involve reconciliation. It might. We hope it does, but it doesn't always. Be ready to be unforgiven. As some people prefer to hang on to things. We can't affect what they do, only what we do. Some things may be best left unsaid, but most are better resolved than hidden. But I can't, you say. I just can't. And that's true. Alone, none of us can. But did you hear, before Jesus talked about forgiveness, did you hear the gift he gave when he told the disciples to forgive? He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Know that you have something within you that provides the strength to face forgiveness. Forgiveness as a gift of freedom from the burden of anger, from the burden of bitterness, from the burden of a life eaten away by a long-nursed hurt. As I thought about forgiveness, and, and you know, what's an illustration? What's a good illustration of forgiveness? I was reminded of one of the first school shootings, actually, a shooting at an Amish grade school, grade school several years ago, probably 25 years ago. Several children were gunned down by a young man who just picked that day and that school to attack. No reason, no grudge, didn't have a reason to pick that school, just showed up and shot these children. Just, he needed to wreak havoc or he needed to make the news, or who knows why he did what he did. The Amish people, some who'd lost children, some who hadn't, rallied around one another, and they gathered, and they supported each other, and they held each other, and they offered whatever comfort they could to the families that were traumatized by this murder and grief. And they also prayed for the families, the, fa the, the further away families that had, that had been wounded, and for the family of the gunmen, because they'd lost a child. And they prayed for the gunmen. They offered forgiveness to a man who barged into their safe, pretty insulated and isolated community and killed several of their children. They offered forgiveness and understanding to this young man and to his family, who were as devastated by the act of their son as the families whose children had been killed. That forgiveness was such an astonishing act that it made the cover of Time magazine. Imagine that, forgiveness as a cover story. News people focus not just on the sensationalism of, of the shooting, sure, they named that, but they also focused on the profound, faith-filled actions of those families. Forgiveness for all the world to be astounded. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and informed by generations of nonviolent teachings so those Amish mothers and fathers forgave the murder of those children. The murderer didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't say he was sorry, he didn't make restitution, but they gave it. They let go of the anger and the separation from God. And they understood, they did it because they understood that what they bound on earth, they would bind in heaven. And they chose not to be bound by hatred for that young man. 
Eugene Peterson has it right in the message. If you don't forgive, what are you going to do with what happens? In every event, we have a choice to make. And by the grace of God, we have the Holy Spirit to help us make that choice. Let us pray that the choice will be unbinding and forgiving and setting all of us free. Amen. Let's close, oh, let's close, let's sing our hymn. And I don't have my bulletin up here, so I don't have the hymn number, but you do. 827. 817. We walk by faith and not by sight.